Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Hillside Community Church for the 18th of April, 2021. For those of you who are from our church, I'm looking forward to the day when we can meet together. Uh, next Sunday, I am going to be preaching online, and we're going to be having a communion service. So next Sunday, come prepared with uh, your communion elements to participate in the communion service together online. Today, I'm going to be continuing my series in the book of 2 Corinthians, and uh, we're going to be talking this morning about church discipline um, as an act of love. And this is not an easy uh, subject to deal with, and it's not a very popular subject to deal with, um, but a very necessary thing to understand um, when it comes to having a healthy church and, and, and uh, being able to, to be everything that God desires us to be in this world for Him. So would you bow with me in prayer this morning as we open today's message. Jesus, I just want to thank you for each person that's tuning in on the broadcast today. God, I just pray that you would open our hearts to hear what it is that your Spirit is saying and that we would learn and that we would grow together and that we would understand uh, how much you love us, Lord, and how much you desire us to love one another. And I just pray in Jesus' name that all of this would just sink into us, Lord, and that we would take what you want us to take out of it. In Jesus' name, amen. So, as I was saying, this uh, subject of church discipline isn't always uh, an easy subject for a pastor to speak on. And, and uh, you know, as I've been going through this uh, passage of Scripture, I, uh, I'm looking at this and I'm going, oh God, help us, to, help us to approach such things with the right spirit and, and, and in the right way. You know, Paul was the founder of the Corinthian church, as you know, and um, some time before he wrote this letter to, this, to the Corinthians, the second letter to the Corinthians, um, he, he had planted the Corinthian church in one of his missionary journeys. And after he planted the church, um, we see that in the book of Acts chapter 18. If you read Acts 18, you'll see the, the founding of the Corinthian church and what happened there. But after being established, Paul, um, take, Paul took leave and he continued on his apostolic mission to plant other churches in other places. So he went on to establish other churches in other cities. And uh, while he was on his journeys and while he was establishing other churches, Paul, Paul heard that uh, there was some trouble in Corinth. And some things were being done by the people there that uh, were not in line with the teachings that he gave. And, and correspondingly, they, they were not pleasing to God. So in response to the trouble that was reported to him, um, Paul wrote and sent a letter, the letter of 1 Corinthians, uh, to them with his brother and the person he was mentoring as a young pastor, Timothy. Now, it appears that Timothy, when he went to Corinth uh, with the letter, that he was not received all that well. And um, the letter had contained some, some rebuke in it. And many of the people in this church um, rejected Paul's teaching and you know, were, were questioning his authority that was given to him by God. But um, this necessitated further follow-up, and it was grievous. And, and Paul ended up sending Titus, and there was more favorable response, but he followed up visiting the church himself in what Paul called the painful visit. So, um, you know, you can imagine that uh, it was pretty rough when your visit to a church, if you're the Apostle Paul establishing churches, is called the painful visit. Now, it's, there's not really a, a really good explanation as to all of the things that were so painful about this visit, but it, it seems to be that Paul attended uh, the Corinthian church to address some issues that were taking place that needed disciplinary um, process. Now, according to the writings, there appears to be a major incident of concern in uh, the Corinthian church. Um, 
You see, some, some people in the church decided to do something that was immoral. And the Corinthian church had let it go and, and, and was accepting of it. So in, in this first letter uh, to the Corinthians in chapter 5, um, Paul reprimands the church for tolerating a man and uh, a lady in their assembly and not just tolerating him, but also being proud or approving of what he was doing. And this man had, we don't know all the details. We don't know what the circumstances were, but this man had gotten together with um, and was having a sexual relationship with his father's wife. Now, not his mother, but some Maybe his mother passed away. I don't know the we don't know the circumstances, but anyways, this man had gotten together with his father's wife and was having relations with her. And Paul tells the Corinthians that they should have put this man out of their fellowship. And he tells them that this kind of sexual sin was not even tolerated amongst the pagans, and and the pagans, quite frankly, in Corinth um, were known for their, uh, their blatant immoral behavior. Uh, this was one of the things with Corinth. It was known to be a place where that sort of thing was, was promoted. Uh, where they were not known for their chaste behavior, let's put it that way. And Paul said that this man was to be handed over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit might be saved in the end when he came to his senses. Now, Paul calls the church in Corinth to discipline this man and not to associate with him and not even to eat with him and tells them essentially that it's not their place to judge the people outside of the church in the world, but um, that's God's realm. But within the church, uh, they are to actually judge those who are inside of the church when it comes to sin um, that is unrepentant, so it does not spread like uh, yeast throughout the body of Christ and corrupt it. So Paul tells the church to discipline this man. Um, but apparently this message and some of the other messages he had about uh, the way that they were worshiping and, and reveling and not doing the right things, um, that it didn't go down very well with some people. And, uh, you know, I, I've known, and you've probably known people too, who are very staunch uh, and, and morally against something, some activity of people's behavior until it actually enters into their family. And then once it, it happens with their children or their spouse or their cousins or relatives or even their close friends, then because they love that person, um, they find themselves changing their tune and accepting the sinful behavior that would never have been accepted before that happened. And well, you know, it's true that our emotions and our, our feeling of affinity towards people that we love can lead us to be tempted to lower our standards. And sometimes, um, you know, this happens in churches. Well, this, according to the letter of the Corinthians, something like this happened in the church with this man. I mean, these people were proud of him. So we don't really know the circumstances that made them sort of change their tune in what was acceptable. So they found themselves even uh, justifying an act that was even looked at as repugnant in the eyes of the pagans. Um, we don't really understand how it got to that point, but um, Paul has a tough call to make here. Uh, sometimes being in leadership is tough business. There are things that are unpleasant sometimes that need to be done and need to be said for the overall health of the body of Christ. And um, the truth of the matter is not everybody in the church when a leader has to stand up and say something is, is, is being done wrongly, not everyone's going to like that. And uh, Paul wrestled 
with this in the case of the Corinthian church. So he, that's kind of the backdrop to what we're talking about here this morning. Um, 2 Corinthians 2, 1 to 11 says this, So I made up in my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you. For if I grieve you, who is left to make me glad, but you of whom I have, I have grieved? I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I would not be distressed by those who should have made me rejoice. I have confidence in all of you that you would all share my joy. For I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart, and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know of the depth of my love for you. If anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent, not to put it too severely. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. So when we look at this scripture, we see the case of discipline. It's not implicitly stated that the him being referred to is the one that Paul had spoken to in 1 Corinthians 5 in his first letter, but, but it appears that way. It caused grief to the people as Paul held his ground against what had taken place. And Paul, he wouldn't let it go. He insisted on writing to them even though it was uncomfortable. It seemed that the Corinthians were acting like carnal babies in the faith rather than approaching things with maturity. Paul was grieved in, in having to deal with their spiritual immature behavior and their tolerance for fornication and that kind of idolatry. Um, writing in his letter and, and visiting them had apparently caused Paul to grieve here to the point of tears out of the anguish and the depth of despair of his heart for them. And Paul, he dearly loved these people and, and he did not desire them uh, to continue in something that would be so destructive to them. And, and he didn't want to come to them in, in person with a disciplinary approach for the sake of lording it over them. That, that was not his his um, desire. Paul was genuinely concerned with their spiritual well-being. Some people in the church had been digging in their heels against Paul. And, uh, you know, Paul had to um, have a painful visit, it seems. Well, on the subject of sin, um, let's talk about this for a, a little bit. Uh, once we become a new uh, creation in Christ and are saved, we're um, sealed as a child of God to say that no longer we are our own. We are set apart with a stamp of the seal of God on our lives. It's as if God stamps us with this wax seal that just seals our salvation and, and says, you are mine. So because we are the Lord's, um, we have been brought from death into life. We're saved by God's grace, not by works. Um, but once he saves us, God wants to do uh, a work in us. And he wants us uh, to do everything we can to surrender to his lordship and, and, and push away from sin. Why? Sin, sin is rebellion and God wants us to be a good testimony of Jesus Christ. And that is what we should be. Now, God's purpose for us is not to be in rebellion against him and his, and his, and his, um, his goodness. But his, his, his purpose is that we, um, we are changed, we are morphed into a new creation and that we reflect Jesus Christ to the world around us and the freedom that is in him to be holy. And, and this is why Paul makes it very plain to the Corinthians that the man whom he had just written in his first letter to them about had not just caused him grief, 
but to some extent was the source of all of their grief. So we have this huge problem and, and um, you know, sin is destructive. Either way, it's horrific. A bad response to correct discipline, uh, the promotion of wrong discipline or the choosing not to discipline has caused so much trouble in, in the churches. And, and this is why there's been so much division over the years and so much division in recent days. But in, in the case of these Corinthians, as painful as it was, the majority did decide to follow the instruction of Paul. And they did the right thing. And the man who was sleeping with his father's wife was put out of fellowship. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Now, we're not told the nitty gritty details about how this all went down. But suffice to say that uh, the measure of discipline evoked against this man was effective. It appears that handing him over to Satan, you know, at the, uh, I guess, the disdain of some people, did in fact destroy his flesh. And the man was broken and he was sorrowful. This measure actually worked. The man regretted his decision to sin. You know, when we're confronted by our sin and we're sorry for it, it gives us an opportunity to repent. And, and this is why the church is called to act in discipline towards sin that affects the whole community in its scope. And, and in the case of the Corinthians, they did the right thing and there was a positive result. And this is where another principle of Scripture kicks in at this point. Rather than, than painting a person with a brush and leaving him in the category as kind of the untouchable for his whole life because of his actions, you know, we're all sinners and there's sometimes we make bad decisions and boy, if it was not for God's grace, where would we be? And if it's not for the grace of others, where could we be? You see, the purpose of discipline, both with God directly to us as an individual and the purpose of corporate discipline in, in the church is actually restoration. And Paul encourages the congregation in Corinth to forgive this man uh, for what he did and to comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So Paul continues in verse 7, he says, Now instead, speaking to the Corinthians, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. Another reason I wrote to you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us. For we are not unaware of his schemes." So here Paul tells the believers that they had been tested to see if they would obey the word of God rather than their own emotions on the matter in question. Their disobedience to the word of God in the beginning made him sorrowful, but in the end, their repentance in doing what was right brought him great joy. The apostle Paul, you see, he, he loved the people of the church, including the one who had done the wicked deed. He told them the truth. And love tells, us, tells what is true. The, the Corinthians needed to hear the truth that would enable them to be corrected in their patterns of thinking. Now, as leaders in the church today, just as it was in those days, it's important for us to see that when we tell people the truth correctively, when their thinking's askew, we're acting in love and facilitating them an opportunity to grow and mature. And we're also protecting the fabric of our community. And it's absolutely essential that whenever some form of discipline is given, that we're acting out of absolute undying love. Now, what is the standard? for this love. What is the standard for the truth that we speak? It, it is none other than the Word of God. It, it can't be just our personal uh, feelings or, 
you know, our personal observations. We have to measure everything and weigh it out in context with the Word of God. Not feelings, not emotions, not human reasoning or preferences. The Word of God needs to be our standard for what is right, even when it doesn't jive with, with what we feel. And, and the Corinthian church was having a struggle with this. They felt a certain way towards this man, whatever reason, we don't understand. I mean, that's repugnant to us to, to even think about. But the Corinthian church, for whatever reason, were, were soft towards this guy. And, and it was difficult for them to come and to obey what Paul was saying by putting him out of fellowship. They didn't like how it felt. But Paul was saying, do this in the spirit of love, and eventually they needed to do it. You see, when we approach someone that's needing to be disciplined, um, we, re we really need to be pleading with them, look, you know, I, I adore you. Why, why are you doing this? Why are you choosing to live this way? When, when you know the light of the scriptures and what the scriptures say about this, you know, why would you want to hurt yourself, hurt your family, hurt your friends, hurt your children? Why would you choose to do this when you know that the scripture speaks contrary to what you're doing? You know, this isn't the way that the Lord would want you to live. You know, this isn't good for you. I love you so much, but you really need to stop and turn away from this destructive behavior that you're approaching. See, that's what we need to do when it comes to church discipline. It's not a matter of just wagging the finger in front of them and condemning them. We need to do any kind of discipline that is necessary in the church out of love and in a spirit of love. See, the Corinthians... They struggled with this. They struggled through this. This was tough. Paul grieved. He cried. It brought him to tears. This was tough. He sent envoys ahead. He wrote letters. He, he visited them in person painfully. Um, but the church, the Corinthian church, in the end, they actually passed the test. They set those feelings aside and they did the right thing. And as a result, there was joy because there was restitution of a, of a believer who had gone astray, who was going down the wrong path. Now, you see, discipline was necessary with this, this man who had done this thing with his father's wife. But this action by... The church doesn't mean that every time we see someone else in our life commit a sin that we disassociate ourselves with them. Um, we ourselves sin. People sin all the time. And this is not what Paul's trying to say because, you know, if we did this, we'd be constantly disassociating ourselves with each other all the time. We're talking about a, a serious situation involving an unrepentant heart where a person's been appealed to in the name of love repeatedly, but they continue to refuse every approach and say, no, I don't care what you say. I don't care what you think. I don't care what God thinks. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. You see, there comes a point where we as Christians need to respond to that kind of, of um, reaction from an individual. And this is where Paul and the Corinthians had taken a step of church discipline. Now, now these loving actions of Paul and the Corinthian church were painful at the time, um, but the end result was positive. And, and this man became sorrowful for being put out of the fellowship. And he saw that what he had done was wrong. And, and Paul says to the people, you know, let's look at this. Let's look at this man's state of heart and forgive him and bring him back into fellowship. And, and that was the goal of this whole thing in the first place, you know. Now, we can't be duped by Satan's schemes. And when we do this, you know, like Satan has schemes out there and he's attempting to outwit 
the people of the church. And, and what are some of these schemes? I, I'm going to talk to you about two of them. The first one is that the church, uh, he wants the church to think that sin doesn't really matter. And, and people should be able to continue sinning and tolerating sin so that God's grace might abound. God's grace is given to us. So let's just live how we want and not worry about sinning. And what does Paul say about this? He says, God forbid. You see, some churches have bought into the spirit of the age and have taught that when what a person does with their own lives um, and how they do it is their own business. What they're saying, in fact, is that um, because God has grace on the sinner, that the sinner should be able to resolve their own issues and they're an island unto themselves and what they do uh, should be just between them and God. Um, but um, this is this is wrong, and uh, it it is actually the church's business because it can pollute the whole body, and also that person, if we love them, they're going to self destruct. Um, you know, I realize that sometimes it's hard to stand up against sin, but the true teaching of the Bible would suggest that not preaching against sin or teaching on holiness actually leads to destruction and corruption in the body of Christ. It leads a church to being ineffective, you know, putting a shroud over the light of the gospel. And, you know, people who come to seeker-friendly churches, that's what we, we term this, um, come to accept the gospel that's not complete. The scriptures tell us that anyone who wishes to be a follower of Christ uh, needs to deny themselves, pick up their cross, and follow Jesus. But the seeker-friendly, you know, sin-tolerant church is, is falling prey to the scheme of Satan. He wants the churches to say that a person doesn't need to deny themselves no, you don't need to deny yourselves. Seeker-friendly churches would say all you need to do is pick up your cross, identify with the cross, clutch a rosary, put a necklace on with a symbol, attend church once a week, and uh, you know, sing some hymns and sing some songs and, and listen to the preacher and you know, the positive message. Take the positive out of it. You know, chew on the, the positive meat and, and reject anything that makes you feel uh, convicted or wrong. Never deal with the root of sin. Never surrender to the Lordship of Jesus. Never follow Jesus, imitating Him in the holiness of His, of his behavior. Um, the church that does not deal with sin that affects the corporate body of believers is not a threat to the kingdom of darkness. And Satan knows it. Therefore, his scheme is to get people to be unconcerned about sin in their midst and get everyone just to let it go and, and turn their head. That's not the will of God. If we love one another, we have to be accountable to one another and we have to hold each other accountable sometimes. So if someone is doing something that's hurting them or hurting the corporate body, you need to stand up and say, listen, this isn't right. You need to turn. There's scriptural process for this. Now, the second thing that Satan schemes is to make a church a place where legalism abounds, where everybody's looking um, at picking at everybody's life. It makes for this church where there's this hierarchy of holiness and, and where faith is all about works and, and, and appearances. And this is a place where legalism abounds. And, and Satan schemes at this. He wants this kind of church to pro proliferate. Uh, the people are harsh and unforgiving and begin to judge their neighbors, like I'm saying, to make themselves look better. When a person is repentant and the church refuses to accept them and categorizes them by their past failures, uh, you know, where brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so messes it up. Therefore, they've dropped a rung on the ladder. Therefore, you know, they're not part of the elite group. I may not invite them into my social circle. Also, associate with sister so-and-so and brother so-and-so and we'll have our little group. But uh, those guys there, they're kind of on a lower here, the lower tier over here. And we're not going to have, we're not going to bring them into our, our fellowship. Oh, man, this is poisonous. Satan schemes to render churches into self-righteous mausoleums where people with real problems are forced to hide under uh, a fake facade so that they won't be judged. 
and, and uh, where they in fact participate in judging others to raise themselves up in the hierarchy. This church becomes this dead place where outwardly there's all these rules being followed, but there's no love. It becomes Pharisee. It becomes a big stick religion, not a religion that is based on love and grace. And Jesus, you know, he had a whole lot of negative things to say about this kind of religion because uh, this church, when it takes root, becomes deadness. So in conclusion, we see that Paul sets the standard for how we handle situations where people refuse to listen to sound scriptural instruction willfully following their own flesh. However, as corporate discipline, it has to be a last resort when it comes to proper handling people, properly handling people out of love for them. Um, we need to be very careful when we approach another believer uh, who's fallen into sin. And we need to approach this prayerfully, tearfully. Paul, he, he spent hours, I'm sure, praying over the Corinthians, praying over this man, you know, and he didn't speak quickly or, 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 or lightly. It was something that was weighty. And uh, Paul speaks to the Ephesians. And this is how we need to approach people when we first start out down this road. As a prisoner in the Lord, Paul says in Ephesians 4, then I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling you received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love and with diligence to preserve the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. We need to, as Paul was saying here, humili with humility and gentleness, we need to bear with one another in love and with diligence, you know, make every effort to keep unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. So we need to approach things carefully. When we talk to someone, we need to say, hey, you know, brother Clint, you know, you've got something here that, man, you need to look at. It's, you know, I've heard you say this and, you know, that's not right. It's gonna hurt you. And, uh, you know, can I pray with you about that? You know, I, I love you, brother. I wish I, can, I could, uh, you know, bear your burdens for you. Can you, you want to talk to me about what's going on? You know, that kind of approach at first, right? And, and then Paul speaks to the Galatians in Galatians 6, 1, where he says, brothers and sisters, if someone's caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, uh, or you may also be tempted. So there's a case here where the proper course of action is to, uh, um, to take that person aside and restore them gently, um, continuing on with, with the spirit of love, right? Restore them gently. Tell them, hey man, you need to stop this. You know, warn them once. You know, if they don't respond, approach them again. Try a different angle. Do it prayerfully. Do it lovingly. Do it gently. But ultimately, there comes that case where a proper course of action is to step in and um, bring it to the elders of the church. And the elders of the church need to bring it forward to the congregation. And there needs to be uh, a progression in this. Um, you know, the elders of the church would approach that person if you are unsuccessful and and seeing that person turn, then the elders of the church will talk to them and, and see if they'll respond to that. And if they don't respond to that, there may be um, action that needs to be taken in the church uh, to put a stop to the course of evil. And in this case, they've been warned, they've been spoken to, and it's clear that they're not teachable. They're not repentant. They're proud and they're unwilling to change. A person who refuses to listen to the soundness of scriptural teaching and displays a spirit of rebellion um, towards God's word, see, is, is one who's gonna cause corruption and division in the church and one that's going to cause destruction in their own life. And, and something needs to stop here. And uh, we need to intervene in that case. Um, you know, any number of unrepentant sins will cause corruption and division within the church, not just the sin of fornication as addressed by Paul, 
in the case of all sin, the root of rebellion must be dealt with. Um, because if it isn't, then it's going to deal a blow to the church. It's going to infect the church, and the church is going to be um, falling to Satan's schemes to render that church in productive, unproductive and ineffective in shining the light of the gospel to their community. And, you know, Paul, you know, for example, tells Titus in Titus chapter 3.10, um, you know, sin causes division and causes trouble. And Titus, sa it says in Titus 3.10, warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful and they are self-condemned. In cases like this, and, and in cases like the fornicating brother in Corinth, and uh, where any brother or sister will not turn away from activities that are clearly hurting others in, in the church and, and the witness of the church and the community, uh, church discipline is a necessary step out of love, out of love for the person, um, and out of love for the church. And if sinful action is permitted to go unchecked, uh, it's going to result in bending to the scheme of Satan and destroying um, the church's witness, both individually and corporately. So I, I guess all of these things are difficult for us to absorb and, and talk about, but this is God's word and, and this is what happened in Corinth. And we need to take this to heart when it comes to dealing with sin um, on the local church level. So. I, I pray that each of you will uh, take this to heart and if you're struggling with sin um, that you would turn away from it and that you would follow the Word of God and if you're in that place where you have a brother or sister that's willfully doing things that you know are destructive to them and to the body of Christ you need to try and restore that person gently and then if that person doesn't respond bring it to the elders and if the elders are unsuccessful in that, there may be the case for corporate discipline. And um, this is painful. And uh, God has given us this as a template to follow. So God bless you today. And I pray that you would, uh, you would just have a wonderful afternoon and that this would be something that causes us all to, to think and, and pray for one another. All of us have trouble sometimes with sin, and we need to pray for one another. Would you pray for each person that comes to mind to you today, and pray that God would help them to strengthen and, and to live in a way that's pleasing to Him, and also for yourself. Pray that you would be yielded to the Spirit and willing to listen to His Word, no matter how uncomfortable that makes you feel, or no matter how it goes against your personal, um, you know, uh, soul feelings. Um, we need to do what is right in this day and age. Amen.